Well, like I said, I'm speaking as more than a pastor today. This is more than a sermon. It's a prophetic word. It's an important one. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would fill this house, that, Lord, you would motivate us, that you would fill us, Lord, that our passion would be worthy of you. Lord, that every word would come from your throne and that we'd be changed by them. Thank you, Jesus. Well, you all know that yesterday there were 11 deaths in a synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. You all know that we've had violent confrontations all over the country. You know that we've had character assassination going on directed at good men by people who lie and manipulate the, the, the truth. There have been words of hatred. There have been name calling hurled back and forth. We've had riots in the streets. And each side, left and right, each side claims righteousness. Each side claims innocence and calls the other side evil. Am I telling the truth? We've seen, in this season of time, we've seen families breaking up, crime rates rising. There's an opioid crisis that's added to the rest of our drug problem. We have problems at our border. Lawlessness is increasing. What's happening to our nation? What's going on? And I'm going to explain it. And in the process, I'm putting on my prophetic hat. Now this ends in a word of hope and victory, but first I have to paint a picture of the situation. I have to talk about why it is as it is. And so I want you to bear with me because we clearly, we, we need to clearly understand some things. Now you might think, you might think that what is tearing our country apart is politics. I want you to tell you it's not politics. It's not about politics. If you think it's about politics, that's a mistake. That's a misdirection. Because the root of it is not political. The problem in our country cannot be fixed politically. The problem in our country is rooted in idolatry. The problem in our country is rooted in the worship of or, do, or, or devotion to something other than God. Amen. Now, human beings are built to worship something. We can't help it. It's the way we're created. We are, we are absolutely hardwired to devote ourselves to something that stands in the place of God because God created us that way. It's the way that we're made. We're built to give devotion to something that seems transcendent, something that promises to give us power over life and over circumstances. No culture on earth has ever been without its object of worship, without its idea of God, that something that seems to transcend us. In India, it's Hinduism, and Hindus have thousands of gods. In Asia, it's the Buddha. Here, you and I, we have Christianity. Arabs have Allah. Even communist countries that claimed to be atheistic weren't really atheistic because what they did was they exalted the state to the, to, to the place of worship and, and divinity. The state and its philosophy. In North Korea, they make a religion of the dear leader Kim Jong-un. You go there, you'll see Kim Jong-un's pic un's picture on every wall. So you could claim, I mean, you, you could actually claim to be an atheist. But trust me, you have a faith. I hope an atheist is listening today out there somewhere. You can claim to be an atheist, but you do have a faith. It might be, it might be faith in yourself. It might be humanism, you know, that, that exaltation of humanity. But there's going to be something. Nationalism can become a form of religion. And in America, we tend, we tend to mix nationalism with our faith and call it Christianity. It's idolatry. When devotion to somebody's country or, or their race or their ethnicity becomes a primary identity or, or a source of power, even when it's subtly mixed with our Christian faith, then hatred, abuse, and exploitation become inevitable. 
It might be, you know, that idol might be pursuit of power and money to fill that inner vacuum. But there's going to be something that you worship, whether you go to church or not, something that you worship. It's inevitable. It is built in. You can't help it. Whether you know it or not, you will place your faith in something that you believe gives you power, that gives you a sense of importance or significance. And if God is pushed out, something not God will take up residence at the center of your life and you'll seek to draw strength from it. Something that promises to empower you, something that promises to create a good feeling. Now you can walk with the God of love. You can be consumed by who and what he is, or you can be consumed by forms of hate flowing from some other source that you've given yourself to. I don't believe there's an in-between. Now, the reason I'm talking this way today is, people, we are at a serious, serious hour in history. And I want to scream, church, wake up, please. Because the church at large is not awake. We see this thing consuming our nation. God pushed out various idolatries taking his place. If you go back in scripture, God started with Moses by saying this, or not, I'm sorry, probably, bleh, yeah. One of them guys. Yeah, Moses. <laughs> it's been a long week, people. Genesis 20, verse two. <laughs> I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. Now it's not that God wants to hurt our kids, it's that what you and I choose affects the generations that come after visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. In other words, what he's saying is it was my power, it was my love that delivered you from Egypt. You shall turn to no other power for life or for deliverance. No other source. There is no other God. There is no other name. There is no other creator. So what happens? What happens when an individual or person begins to push God out of the picture? What happens when there's a turning away? What what, what happens when there's a pushing God to the side? What happens when there's a denying of God altogether? What happens when a person or a nation forgets and turns away from Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 that says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind, what happens is that we inevitably turn to other sources and we make of them a sacred religion. Because that built-in hunger to worship something can't be denied. It never dies. It's in our nature. We might not call it worship. But that's what it is, and we'll defend it. Once we've, once we've chosen it, we'll defend it with a ferocious devotion. And that thing that we choose if we push God out, that thing we choose will always be the easier path. It'll be the less demanding road. It'll be the way of least resistance. It'll be the path that asks less of us while it promises more and robs us instead. If a nation, as a nation, rejects God, something will take God's place. And whether or not you call it God, it'll promise power over life. It'll promise power over over situations. And because it is not God, it will unleash hatred when it's challenged. Our nation has replaced God with a long list of philosophies and assumptions and judgments and political stances and the unavoidable result is conflict and hatred. Didn't realize I was this angry until just now. God is love and truth. 
Everything else leads to hatred, deception, and lies. End of story. This choosing of something other than the one true God as a source is why Israel stoned the prophets and rejected them. They challenged, the prophets challenged the false gods that people had put in place of the one true God. And when you challenge a false god, that's how people react. It's always been true and it's true now. When you challenge a false god. That's why they threw Jeremiah down a well. That's why they imprisoned Micaiah and fed him on bread and water. It's why they crucified Jesus. It's why they whipped and beat the apostle Paul and stoned him and left him for dead. Because they all confronted what people had worshipped in place of the one true God, our Father. When you confront someone else's, when you confront someone's false God, they take offense and they react with violence and anger. The struggle in ancient Israel over and over and over again for centuries. The goal of the prophets was always to purify the hunger. To purify the desire that's in human beings for something to worship. It was to purify that undeniable tendency to worship a God, something that would give power over life and circumstance. And so the prophets called the people to, 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 to a purity of devotion to, to the one God. But Israel kept putting other gods in the place of the one true God as those false gods promised power and prosperity. Well, there came the Babylonian exile. Babylon came and destroyed the nation destroyed Jerusalem, tore down the temple in 586 BC, 70 years of exile. It cured them of worshiping other gods. And still, still they substituted another God for the one true God and thought that what they put in his place was God himself. And you're saying, well, what do you mean? Well, they made an idol out of God's word and his law. And they thought that was purified devotion to God. They began worshiping the law itself. And they confused that with the actual worship of God. And when they did that, they began to misinterpret, they began to misapply God's law, and so the inevitable happened, love was lost. God himself is love, but love is always lost when idolatry enters in, and there wasn't much very loving about the Pharisees. When it's, you know, with God it's love, with idolatry it's hate, always. And so legalism took hold in Israel. And with it came hatred for anybody who didn't walk their way and see devotion to God the way they did. It resulted in violence in the soul. It resulted in violence to the flesh. Prophets were stoned. Sinners were shunned. Jesus was crucified. In our nation, we've driven God from public life. We've driven God out of our schools. And and our, our substitutes for God have become political ideology, accusations of racism, political correctness, even gender. I know of people who've divorced because one of them voted for Hillary and the other voted for Trump. I'm serious, I'm not kidding you. Marijuana's become a religion for a lot of people in this nation. They wouldn't call it that. But all I have to do to attract angry attacks and and, and, and all kinds of ridiculous arguments is to go on the net on my Facebook page and say something about the evils and dangers of marijuana. And people are going to react with anger. And they'll, and they'll, (laughs) they'll, they'll challenge you in the same way that Muslims do if you say something bad about Muhammad. (laughs) This is demonically fueled and it brings out a demonic response. I don't care if it's legal in Colorado. If you're smoking dope, you're playing with demons. End of story. Be mad at me if you like. Marijuana promises power over something. That's why it's an idol. Promises power over things like emotions or or power over stress. Just the same way that any false god does. Demons love that stuff because it's a god substitute. It's the worship of a demon because you've turned to something other than the one true God to get power over life. But it ruins life. 
Because you'll worship either the God of love who upbuilds and who, and who strengthens and who sets free, or you're going to worship a false God that destroys, but you will worship something. Ancient Israel, they took a look at the, they, they saw the nations around them prospering and they wanted to be like them. They wanted to have what they had. And they began then to allow elements of the worship of Baal into their lives. They even allowed it to infiltrate the way they worshiped God in order to gain the power that they believed their neighbors had. And they didn't even see anything wrong with it. And it resulted in violence. It resulted in sacrifice of their children to Baal Molech, just like we sacrifice children to abortion today sacrificed on the altar of their desire for prosperity and power, and it resulted, in explo- it resulted in exploitation of the poor. It resulted in neglect of the elderly. People will always have a God. If they reject the one true God, they'll choose another, whether they recognize it as that or not. And in some cases, they'll think that what they believe about that false God is the one true God. But God is love. And any other When any other God is chosen and worshipped, the opposite of love happens because no other God can ever be love. And so we get hatred, we get broken relationships, we get wars, we get divisions, we get separations, we get violence, and history is filled with examples. So what's happening to our nation? Well, as we've written God out of public life, We've rejected his laws and his principles and his church attendance has declined. And there's this lie going out there, oh, you don't have to attend church to be a Christian. I want to say BS, but I can't say what I want to say. Get a clue, believers. His church attendance has declined. Other gods have taken the place of the one true God. Why? Because it was the easier path. It was the path of least resistance that asked the least of us. Just as happened, same thing that happened with Israel. When a nation or a people or individuals turn away from the one true God whose love, hatred will take its place. And it will often masquerade as something good. Because Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. And so hatred will come through those on the left and it'll masquerade as a fight for justice. And for the downtrodden, hatred will come from the right in the form of nationalism and love of country. But it all leads us to the same place. It'll come in the form of people applying God's laws without the love that tempers them and brings repentance and and, and redemption. That's religion. Within the Christian community, we make gods out of doctrines. Until people start hurling hatred and accusation at other believers who hold different views of the same scriptures. Or you encounter those who make the Bible their God instead of the one who wrote the Bible. And they end up hurling hatred at people who love the move of the Holy Spirit because, no, it's only the Bible. What's happening to our nation? We're suffering the effects of idolatry in our culture at every level. In our government in our families, in the church. God is love. Worship anything else. Seek power for life or strength from any other source. And hatred and division will be the inevitable result. The book of Amos, in an attempt to save Israel, God brought six indictments against them, all based on idolatry. The first one was rejection of God's law. You've rejected God's law. Amos 2.4 says they rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. Even in the church, basic morality, basic integrity get compromised. And one of the most popular teachings going around in the body of Christ right now excuses that rejection. The doctrine is called hyper-grace. Oh, God's so loving and so full of, of grace that... You know, you can pretty much do what you want to because you're forgiven. Once you're a Christian, you'll never need to repent again. That's going around. Proverbs kind of sharpens that issue. It describes what I see happening today. Proverbs 28, 4. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. <coughs> Have you seen that? Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. But those who keep the law strive with them. 
Here's the second indictment. He said, Israel, you've believed in lies. Amos 2.4 reads on, second half of the verse, their lies also have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. In our culture, these lies involve false gods, demonic philosophies, demonic theologies. I could name some of them. Most of you wouldn't understand what they were. There's one out there that's become popular called open theism. It says God doesn't know the end from the beginning. Yeah, that's a real popular one. Cheap grace. The idea that the idea that once one becomes a Christian, there's no longer any need to repent. It's become really popular in Christian churches to deny the existence of hell because God's too kind to send anybody there. Well, read the Bible, people. Universal salvation. Everybody's saved, no matter what. Wouldn't you like to have Hitler for a roommate? For eternity? Third indictment, economic self-focus. He says, you've been so focused on yourselves. You know, you want riches, you want wealth, you want to prosper. You got that all wrapped up in your religion. Amos 2.6, they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. In the Western, worship, in the Western world, we worship at the altar of prosperity. We're captivated as a people by a preoccupation with self. And the name of that religion is Baalism. That was Canaan's fertility cult that seduced Israel over and over again and infiltrated the worship of the one true God. Sexual immorality, number four. He said, Israel, you're steeped in sexual immorality. And the example from Amos 2, 7 is, is just one of multiple examples in the Bible. It says, a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. When you begin to study scripture, that verse is just one example of forms of sexual perversion and immorality that have become accepted as normal in Israel. Sexual perversion is now regarded in our culture as normal and it's defended as a right. That's idolatry. Fifth indictment, arrogance. Amos 2.7, those who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless also turn aside the way of the humble. You know, in reality, when we neglect God's laws and we choose our own, that's a form of human arrogance against God because we've positioned ourselves as if we think we know more than God. Well, this is the 21st century after all. Our culture actually mocks those who humbly submit to God's law. You know, we get called backward and bigoted and divisive or judgmental. How often do we really honor somebody who stands for God's moral principles? And all of this is evidence that false gods masquerading as angels of light have gotten the attention of the culture of our nation. And hatred results, division results, violence results. Here's the sixth indictment. He says, you, 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 you've got polluted and compromised devotion to God. Amos 2.12 says, but you've made the Nazarites drink wine and you commanded the prophets saying, you shall not prophesy. Nazarites were those who were dedicated to God from birth. They were never to cut their hair and they were never to touch alcohol. That was their dedication. They, they were a special people in Israel. And, and, and so the whole culture came against them saying, you know, you're stupid. You know, what are you doing? Drink, drink wine. There's nothing wrong with this. And you prophets, we don't want to hear from you. Don't tell us we're wrong. Don't tell us to be holy. Shut the frack up. I can use that word. I can use that word. And in our culture today, we don't want to hear holiness preachers, do we? Holiness preachers get rebuked. And the result for Israel then of all of that was God could not bless what did not reflect his own nature. If it doesn't look like him, he's not going to pat you on the head and say, I'm going to pour out my blessing on that. And so there were three things that happened to Israel. First was military defeat. Israel could no, they, 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 they would no longer enjoy the Lord's support to win the battle when the enemy came against them in spite of being well-equipped and strong. And what Amos 
2, 15 and 16 says, as he who grasps the bow will not stand his ground, the swift of foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse save his life. Even the bravest among warriors will flee naked in that day. And what happened is when the invading armies attacked, finally attacked, Israel crumbled. And I want to tell you right now, I'm speaking prophetically, America is living in an extended period of grace right now. It's a time for the church to get right with God. It's time for the church to take up its destiny and walk as we have been called to walk to affect a nation. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But I'm telling you, the time is limited. The hour is urgent. Stop playing around without a turning. It isn't going to make any difference how powerful our military becomes. We will be vulnerable. Second thing that happened to Israel was, as a result of those indictments was economic collapse. The unprecedented prosperity that had grown in Israel as a result of the Lord's favor upon Israel was revoked. Without a turning to God, without a turning to the one true God, that will be the same with our nation. He said in Amos 3.15, I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. We had a warning in 2008. And isn't it interesting that in 2008, the housing market crashed with the overall economy. I will smite the winter house together with the summer house. That was a warning. We live now in a period of respite. We live right now in a period of grace. It's a gift of God. That we, it's a gift, a period of prosperity that we need to use to prepare for what's yet to come. But this time is limited. We have to use it as believers to build up our strength, to build up our devotion, to build up our purity of focus on Jesus. Here's the third thing that happened to Israel as a result of those indictments. Closure of places of worship. He said... Amos 3.14, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and they will fall to the ground. In the days to come, God will not permit churches to continue in which his laws and his standards and his morality and his word and his nature of love that goes beyond understanding are not honored and not taught and not lived out. A reckoning will come. It's already begun. I have seen churches across this country and in this city that once were mega that are now shrunk. Now here's what this message is really all about. This is the good part. Here, (laughs) thank you. Here is our destiny. Here is our glory. Here is our calling. Here is our privilege. Here is our honor in this hour this strategic moment in history. Among those who will hear it, God is bringing about a purity of focus on Jesus, purity of focus on the heart of the Father, a purity of focus among us in this church and among a devoted remnant that I see growing everywhere that I travel. This is not a time for anybody to be walking in a fence. Grow up, get big, get past it. There's a simplicity. There's a simplicity to this devotion. This purity. It's without ambition. It's not about recognition for the sake of building up anybody's kingdom. It's not about seeking glory for anybody's name. It's not about any big name we follow after. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus alone. It's about drinking of him. It's about knowing him. It's about becoming sons and daughters who radiate his presence and his love and his holiness wherever they go. It's people feeling the love, feeling the healing, even at a distance, whenever you and I are around. It's about nothing being more important to us than being with him, no matter what the circumstances around us might be. It's a place where joy and victory cannot be stolen. It's a place, if we come into this place, this purity of devotion, it's a place where trust and rest in Jesus cannot be threatened or shaken or taken from us. We believers are sons and daughters of Abraham. And the promise to Abraham was awesome. The calling that was laid on Abraham's descendants in Genesis reads like this. 
Chapter 22, 17 and 18. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, listen, listen, listen. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. All in your seed, that's you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is our inheritance. This is our role in the earth. That the nations would be blessed with the Father's love and with the revelation of who he is through us. Not participants in the divisions. Not participants in the hatreds that flow from the idolatries that surround us. That's what God means when he says, come out from among them. Jesus said things like this, Matthew 13, start at verse 31. He presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it's full grown, it's larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them, and this is the important one. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman hid or took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. A lot of Americans don't understand leaven because, you know, it's baking powder. We buy our bread at the store, you know, but leaven is a small... Matter of fact, I can tell you a story. There was a time I was really a health nut for a while, and I, I used to make these whole wheat pancakes with real yeast. And what I figured out was I'd pour a little bit of dough on that griddle with the yeast, and pretty soon I'd have a pancake that was that thick. <laughs> it's, a li- it's, a, it's, it's a little bit of a living organism that gets inserted into a quantity of dough, and it doesn't make any difference how little it is. It permeates the whole thing. It multiplies. It infiltrates. It expands. It changes the nature of the dough. Bread made with real yeast tastes different. It's better. It's more nutritious. What Jesus is saying is, listen, we are the change agents in this world. We're not participants in its sickness. We've been called to infiltrate the culture around us. We've been called to exert influence because that's what leaven does. Where we go, listen, where we go, the world changes just because we were there. We're not called to withdraw or fear or defeat. We win because our God is a God of victory. Wherever we walk, the world changes because our God is the creator and we're his kids who inherit from him. We're the, I said this to the prayer group on Thursday. I said, people, we got to understand in all of this, don't be complaining about all the crap that's going on. We're the firewall that stands against destruction. Don't join the destruction. We're the firewall that stands against it. We're the levy against the tsunami wave of hatred that I prophesied years ago that would come and now it's here. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't shoot up schools. When I was a kid, churches didn't have to have security teams. We can't participate in the idolatries of the culture around us. We are Christians, not Canaanites. One thing that I'll never forget, as long as I live, is what happened, I think it was 1971. I was in college at the time. But I'd been working underground in the mines, in the, summer, in the hard rock mines in North Idaho in the summer. And while I was at school, I think it was spring of, of, of that year, there was a fire in the Sunshine Mine. At the time, it was the largest silver mine in our country. The greatest producer of silver. And there was a fire underground. It, 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 there were places where you'd throw waste wood and somehow that combusted and 91 miners died. And while they were trying to get in to rescue these miners, the people of the city, it was, well, the people of the, of, of the county, it was, it was a rough county. I mean, we're talking about a rough characters, you know. That's, the school I went to was, was uh, 
basically sex, fighting, and drinking. I mean, rough town. And so this mob came to the mine. They were going to confront the mine managers, the mine owners, and they were ready to kill him. We're coming for you. We're going to kill you. They were ready to have a riot. My father stood between them, got between the mob and the mine owners, and with the force of the Holy Spirit, put a stop to the whole thing. I'll never forget it. Just with the force of the authority of the Holy Spirit in and put a stop to the whole thing. And I'm telling you, that's us in this world. That's us. We are, we're the ones who are supposed to be standing in peace before the mob. To put a stop to it. We're the ones who should be disarming the violence and the hatred. We're the ones who should be saying it stops here. What's happening to our nation right now is what happens when idolatry in any form takes root and releases hatred in the name of love or justice. If the enemy of our soul couldn't deceive people to think that evil is good, people would never buy it. But all across the country, we're buying into evil thinking that it's good. That it's somehow going to accomplish something. You and I are strategically placed in this hour, called as believers. We are the firewall against the wave of hatred and idolatry that's tearing this nation apart. We're the levy against the flood. I'm pretty certain... I'm pretty certain that the left will blame the right and the right will blame the left for generating the atmosphere of hatred that's driven political figures out of restaurants and resulted in citizens threatening other citizens with violence over differences in political view. And now it's led to a series of bombs being planted. The general atmosphere of hatred that idolatry has created has opened the way for the demon of anti-Semitism to inspire a man to multiple murders in a synagogue in Pittsburgh. Can we blame those people that did that as if we're not part of it? Can the rest of us really claim innocence? I believe the truth is that we all in this nation share the responsibility for love grown cold. No matter what side of the political or, or, or moral or religious divide we stand on, we share the responsibility. Hatred and anger never bear good fruit ever, no matter what the provocation. Never think, here's another piece, never think that hatred for one thing or one group can exist in isolation, as if it applies only to politics or only to the culture war, or only to the man who shoots up a school or a church, or drives a conservative politician out of a restaurant. If you draw the level of love down in one area of life, you will draw it down in every other area of life, in the same way that cancer in one organ will metastasize into every other part of the body if it isn't treated. If you want to love your family, love your enemies. Because it's going to affect families and churches and communities. National repentance with no one on any side claiming innocence is the only remedy. Amen. Let it start with the body of Christ. Amen. And then let us fulfill, let's fulfill the destiny with which the Holy Spirit, for which the Holy Spirit has filled us. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Get a hold of this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your what? Good works. Not your anger, not your hate. They may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. And then let Romans 8, 19 be manifested in us. The anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. That's those who radiate the presence of the living God in purity, who radiate the presence of the living God in holiness to redeem a world in the Father's love. This is what we are called to. This is why this church was planted. That's why we're here. And it's one of the reasons we've been so attacked through the years. It's time for us to rise. 
It's time for people to be lined up around the block to come and get the love. Amen. And it's time for us to resign from this culture that we're in. Yeah. Time for us to model a kingdom culture and what that means. My king is Jesus Christ, Amen. not Donald Trump. My legislator is my God, Amen. not the Senate. Amen. My judge is Jesus Christ, not the Supreme Court of the United States. Amen. So Jesus, write this into our hearts today. Make it part of us. Lord, I pray that nothing I've said today ignites anyone's anger or justifies anyone's hatred. What I pray, Lord, is that it ignites in us a determination, a fiery determination to walk with you and to do it in purity. And I love you more. And I love you.